Reza, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You recently started racing, yeah. specifically NASCAR. You shouldn't start a racing career at 34, <laughs> but heck, uh, when I start something, I always really aim to get really good at it. But where did your entrepreneurial spark start? I, I had to. I had to be an entrepreneur. I, and I rolled into creating websites quite fast. And sure. I always say, don't do that. If you yeah. really want to be an entrepreneur, start tomorrow. And yeah. that's how I literally started that search engine. Yeah. I had a fever. I was I was really sick and I was I think half hallucinating or something like that. But all of a sudden it struck me. Typical Dutch scene with yeah. like cows behind me and, uh, and then there is you know, this guy built the first uh, I made every single mistake I could with that search yeah. engine. It's unbelievable if you think about it. I, I literally had no experience with launching a real product. So that period was really painful because I, I felt we built something really unique. Getting to that product market fit, man, that was hard. Yeah. But once it's there, you're like, okay. Just grow, grow, Let's grow. go. What's up, folks? Welcome to Unravel with Manoj Aditya. Today's guest is Reza Sardeha, who, who has been an entrepreneur since he was 14 and recently sold his company to GoDaddy, which was a domain marketplace, which made waves in the domain marketplace. And now he's reinventing the buying and selling of homes with his new venture, anyone.com. Reza, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So before we get into your journey, you know, you recently started racing. Yeah. Specifically, NASCAR. Yeah. So I really want you to tell me why you're doing this. Um, it's been a, it's been something that I uh, really liked uh, from young on. Yeah. Like, uh, I remember when I was 11 or 12, for the yeah. first time my parents took us to the karting track. I just, I, I, I can dream the first lap. Yeah. Like, it's still there. I remember sitting in the pit and uh, sitting in this weird low thing. And at some point you're allowed to get out and, and, and on the track. And I just pressed the gas and I was like, wow, what is this? And I, yeah. from that moment, I, I really loved it. Really never did a lot with it. But the moment, you know, I find, I found a little bit of time yeah. where I can uh, spend some time on things that I truly love. Yes, yeah. uh, I hadn't done that in the past, let's say, 10 years. Um, I was like, I need to start racing. Right. And uh, Why and NASCAR? The challenge. Right. Like, with everything I do, I, I need a challenge. Mm -hmm. if, if things get a little bit boring or routine fast, it, it's just not exciting. Yeah. And the beauty of NASCAR is it's all mechanical. Right. This car has no digital anything, no, no ABS, nothing. Oh. Your braking is mechanic, your steering is mechanic, yeah. and uh, it's it's pure racing at its heart. And these machines, it's unbelievable. This V8, yeah. the, 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 the sound that the engine makes, the, the whole thing, it's just, uh, it's as raw as you can get it. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, and it's a tremendous challenge to control this beast. Right. And that alone, you know, that, uh, yeah. Yeah. So Excites. is NASCAR now like a hobby or are you going to actually race in like competitions and stuff? I'm bad at keeping things at the hobby <laughs> level. So when I start something, I always really aim to get really good at it. And, right. And I, I see everything as a competitive um, something. And and so, no, the, the goal is, um, yeah, to race. Right, and when I started this journey, I really looked at at people that can help me and guide yep. me. And I, I from day one, I said, "Listen, I know I'm starting old. I mean, I'm, yep. I'm 34, and you shouldn't start a racing career at 34. <laughs> but heck, um, um, but I said, I want to, I want to be, you know, competitive. So yep. I'm, you know, if if I'm going to be last at every single race, yeah, I will stop. Right." But I will give it my best to at least accomplish something. And it's, of course, it makes no sense to think that I can become the number one, two or three. <laughs> but, you know, somewhere around number nine, <laughs> ten, ah, that, that would be a big win for me. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
But I think the adrenaline, the feeling of racing, you know, it's a lot of people's dream, you know, to race and be part, be a racer. Yeah. So for me, it's meditation. Oh, wow. I, I really mean it when I'm like, my brain is always working. It's always churning. Like I always keep simulating, thinking about this, about that. Why I love racing is I'm in the car, a silence drops. Yep. And I'm just focused on taking the next corner after corner as fast as I can. Right. And I love that. It's it's just, I don't think about anything, nice. nothing at all. I'm just thinking about, okay, can I break maybe two meters li- later? Uh-huh. Um, can I maybe t- attack this corner in this way and yeah. see if that improves my time or not? Yeah. It's it's these it's actually entrepreneurship, but then under a high pressure point with a very high penalty. Because if you go over the border yeah. and if you just too fast hit your gas or whatever, you will get punished and badly on the track. Oh wow. So you're in this you know, pressure cooker, <laughs> literally. Yeah. But you're micro iterating. Right. And that's why I like this is the first time I look at it that like that actually, but it's 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 you know micro iteration after iteration and trying to, trying things out just like you know as an entrepreneur we also do that yeah we're experimenting we're looking at what sticks and then we you know we we stay um, doing the things that work and we keep right. experimenting to see if we can do things better and on the racetrack you're it's identical and right. uh, it's it's amazing yeah that's it's great. Uh, I mean, I would love to race someday, but I don't think I'd ever even step into a NASCAR because I don't think I have it in me. Because yeah. it is, it takes a lot to to be that disciplined, yeah. to, that to train so hard. Uh, maybe another sport, but racing, uh, I don't know. Okay, well, you should try. I mean, maybe, maybe it's uh, maybe you're the next Max Verstappen. Who That's knows? not happening. <laughs> <laughs> even Max Verstappen, if he hears this, he's probably going to shoot me. <laughs> okay. So you started out making websites when you were 14 yeah. and then you built a search engine for the Middle East, which yeah. Yahoo killed. And yeah. then you built a domain marketplace that was acquired by GoDaddy. Yeah. And today you're investing everything you made to reinvent the housing market. Yeah, You know, it's a journey of fascination and resilience. I'm actually very curious to dive into your journey and learn about, you know, everything that you've been through. So... The very first question is, let's actually start with where did your entrepreneurial spark start or appear? Yeah. Um, it was around 14, 15. And um, I, I had to. I had to be an entrepreneur because at that time, we didn't have Dutch residency permit yet, which basically means you're not allowed to work. Yeah. And um, all my friends worked at the same restaurant. So like, and they, you know, they made, you know, their, uh, um, uh, an extra buck via that route, but yeah. I couldn't. So that's mm-hmm. when, you know, I started looking online of oh, what can you do? And, um, I, and I rolled into creating websites quite fast because yeah. it's just something about it attracted me. Um, quite soon I did find out that I'm not a great developer because yeah. it's, it's, the type of it just didn't fit me, and and so um, I, you know, I I know how to build things. I know I know the basics, mm-hmm. um, but um, I noticed uh, relatively soon on that um, you know I'm better at you know conceptualizing and just right. doing things because mm-hmm. um, often when I come across entrepreneurs, you know, they have ideas, but those ideas they never execute, and sure. I always say. Don't do that. If you yeah. really want to be an entrepreneur, start tomorrow. And yeah. that's how I literally started that search engine. Yeah. I had a fever. I was I was really sick. And I was, I think, half hallucinating or something like that. But all of a sudden it struck me. And I was like, but why isn't there like we have Yahoo back at the time? We have Google, but there is no real search engine that um facilitates, you know. Uh, searches based on you know the social cultural context of yeah. Middle Easterners. Why is that? Well, it's such a tremendous target yeah. audience, and um, day day after, literally, I started looking for someone to help me build it. Wow! How and old were you when you when you started this search engine? Uh, this was when I was around nineteen. Wow. Okay. And um, 
and you know, and then things go fast because I think three, four months later, there was an initial product. Yeah. And um, we, yeah, we just launched and- um, What was it called? It was called I'm Hello. Okay. Yeah. So the social cultural context there was also that it was a search engine that would return, you know, results yeah. uh, that were tailored to, you know, Middle Easterners. So also, yeah. um, so if you would search for uh, Fox, yeah. you wouldn't get, you know, a half undressed Megan Fox, but, uh, you know, f uh, you know, the animal of Fox. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and... Uh, that I I mean I learned a lot about branding in that time because this brand was really not good yeah. in hindsight but at that point it, it it made a lot of sense. Uh, so how long did this search engine last and how big did it get? Um, literally on the first day we launched, yeah, and I think that's one of the added values of the brand. Yeah, um, um yeah, we got into yeah like CNN and BBC and like wow. all these outlets. Because we launched it like, um, you know, this is the first halal search engine. Mm -hmm. And at that time, that was quite, uh, you know, that, that made quite some, uh, yeah. that raised quite some eyebrows. And uh, <laughs> You're 19 and, and you got uh, interviewed by CNN. That, that must have been like a crazy feeling. Yeah, it was strange. Yeah. Um, but it was also funny. Like, I remember this, this... Uh, um, this interview request came in, yeah. and they 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 sent like this whole crew, you know, videographers and whatnot. Wow! But they didn't expect to, you know, me as mm -hmm. the founder, but also not the setting because I was living at my parents' place and uh, and in this small village in the Netherlands. And um, um, so there is a picture of me from from that that um, that interview where you see me in front of. Um, uh, a very Dutch, typical Dutch scene with yeah. like cows behind me, and, uh, and then there is, you know, this guy built the first uh, search engine for the Middle East, etc. And, uh, and 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 I remember the reporters were like super weirded out when they first met me, and they were like, "Who's this young guy?" What I wasn't was, expecting this when I came. What's happening here? <laughs> and uh, no, nah, it was uh, it was it was a funny period. Right, like I learned a lot in that. Uh, I made every single mistake I could with that search engine. Yeah. It's unbelievable if you think about it. Right. What are the um, what are the mistakes that you can think of? Literally everything in terms of branding, in terms of launching, in terms of like I I literally had no experience with launching a real product. Right. And. Um, at some point, we even took down the search engine because we couldn't handle the traffic. Wow. Um, re rewrote a lot of the code base. Yeah. Uh, hosted it on uh, on a completely different um, uh, so uh, solution provider, which could uh, implement auto scaling and whatnot. And um, like, who does that? Who launches yeah. something and then it catches, you know, on? Yeah. And then goes offline for a month. That's literally what I did. <laughs> I couldn't handle it. And uh, yeah, and the relaunch was successful as well, which is also quite strange if if you think about it. Um, wow. Yeah. And what was like the the weird? Have you analyzed the search results? I did. Like, what was the most weirdest searches or the most popular? thing that people were searching for on your uh, search engine? Well, not weird, but one of the things that I found extremely interesting was that at some point, 40% of the traffic came from the UK, the US and whatnot. Oh, okay. And I would, uh, and we would get emails from um, non-Middle Easterners or non-Muslims that said, thank you for this service because wow. now I can finally let my children explore the internet in a safe way right and i didn't i hadn't you know thought about that user case and at some point we even started building yeah um, um a search engine for a uk company which made a child-friendly search engine wow and we had a partner in the in, in germany that wanted to do s the same thing so without having that you know, as a plan, at some point we were literally building two different search engines for clients all wow. of a sudden, purely based on demand. And for us, it was great because we already didn't know how to, you know, fund this company and the hosting bills kept growing. Yeah. Uh, so we made some money with that, invested that in the search engine again. And uh, uh, no, it was uh, yeah. interesting. Period. So, I mean, 
you famously told me that Yahoo killed your search engine. I'm very curious about the story. What happened? How did it unfold? Yeah, so we were using one of the, I think one of the most innovative solutions that Yahoo at the time was offering, which was um, uh, called Yahoo Boss. Yeah. Boss stands for build your own search engine. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, yeah, you know, we couldn't crawl and index the whole entire World Wide Web. Exactly. And, and so we use that surface, but our own algorithm mm -hmm. for the search engine. So we use Yahoo's index. And um, at some point, Yahoo was like, we love what you're doing. You're, you know, you're one of the bigger uh, solutions built on top of our solution. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. But you use, you're querying us too much. <laughs> yeah. And uh, with just a month's notice, we had to pay $80 cents per thousand queries. Wow. Yeah, I, I had no idea how to, like... And uh, back then, still, we didn't have, you know, our entire family didn't have the Dutch residency permit. Right. So I only had an Iranian passport. And yep. with an Iranian passport, you know, you can't, you know, you're, you're quite limited in terms of where you can travel and whatnot. So um, I ended up in Russia fundraising... <laughs> Literally, I sent the CEO of um, of Yandex, which, yeah. which was a, a Russian search engine, an email via LinkedIn. Yeah. And I asked him, um, you know, look, we're in this situation. We've built something with a lot of momentum. We processed 100 million search queries, um, but we'll be bankrupt in a month mm -hmm. uh, because Yahoo is charging us. Can we do a deal? Because yeah. I had read that they wanted to get into the Middle Eastern market and they actually launched like in Turkey a, mm -hmm. a pilot and whatnot. So yeah, and with my Iranian passport, yeah, there was one country I could go and it was Russia. So I literally, you know, uh, booked the plane ticket, got yeah. the hotel and for three days went to Moscow to their headquarters, tried to strike a deal with them. And, wow. Uh, um, it didn't go well in, in the end because they were excited about what I was doing. Um, but they just uh, went on the NASDAQ. So they had so many opportunities that, yeah, this was not an interesting one for yeah. them. Eventually, I did see, you know, after the whole deal bounced off that they did go into the Middle East um, direction and try to gain a footprint, but never really did, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. This this search engine got me in, uh, let's say, interesting places. <laughs> so what uh, yeah. what did you do after you were not able to fund it or get money from Yandex? What happened next? Um, with a lot of pain in my heart, at some point I had to literally pull the plug. I I literally couldn't afford the hosting bills anymore. Yeah. Do you and remember then, the date? I don't, but I do remember the sorrow that I, like I got into a very depressive mm -hmm. Which year was this? I always forget the year, okay. uh, but this was when I was, because uh, this this entire story was just one year. Oh, like, wow. Like this whole search engine survived for just a year and a couple of months. So you started, scaled yes. magically, and then yes. went to Russia and shut yeah. it down in a, in a matter of two months. Exactly. and um, Crazy. Yeah, it was, it was, um, it hurted so much because I, I, I felt it had so much potential. Yeah. Because I was like, I had a, a search engine distribution deal with Al Jazeera, mm -hmm. uh, almost uh, completely closed. And Al Jazeera was the biggest Arabic co content site. Yeah. So this is one of the strategies Google implemented actually in how they became the number one. They had all these distribution deals. So yeah. when you downloaded a browser, Google search was, for example, the primary search, et cetera. That's how they gained a lot of users. Um, uh, in Malaysia, when we won an award, um, I had a deal with an ISP, a big uh, Malaysian ISP for if people mistype a domain, and it doesn't load to throw, you know, the keyword in our search engine and still deliver, yeah. you know, results instead of, uh, uh, you know, this page can't be loaded. Wow. So there was a lot happening, but I never was able to guide it to continuity or yeah. success. So that period was really painful because I, I felt we built something really unique, but also like... Um, we had specific features no one had. So when you, for example, would uh, click on a search result, we would um, keep an iframe yeah. um, with you 
And then you could say if these results were good or not. And based on your input, we would re-rank uh, results. So it wasn't only like, you know, uh, SEO juiced websites would rank best, which you uh, nowadays see a lot. Yeah. So there was a lot of very interesting things happening as well. And overnight it was, yeah, it was gone. So, and, uh, which means that people, it's even like not just algorithm based search results, but people were contributing to search results. So I can say, okay, this was the best result from everything that I looked 100%. for. hundred percent. And we saw in the data that, you know, the results were really getting better. Yeah. Um, and um, on scale, you know, we also had this vision where we wanted to API fi yeah. search. With that, I mean, the end user could go and look for specific search solutions, mm -hmm. vertical search solutions. For example, someone could um, index uh, or uh, only the restaurants in Amsterdam. And then you could search through the menus of these restaurants. So you right. could really tailor, go and find information um, and and really tailor, uh, like, like specifically create a tailored search uh, experience per user. Right. But we never got there because yeah. the company had to already shut down before we really could go in that direction. Yeah. It really hurts a yeah. lot. And I found a reason why, like, come on, it, it, it was, you know, it was gaining momentum. Mm -hmm. And to have to shut down something yeah, at hard. that point, it was just very painful. Uh, right. Yeah. And in this two months, you also won an award in Malaysia. Yeah, we won an award, which was uh, given to us by the former prime minister of Malaysia, etc. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember that that was the moment I I, I was like, what's happening here? Did like, you feel like you made it or you're like, okay, this is like a weird <laughs> trip? <laughs> well, I, I remember the anxiety because I also had to give a presentation. And I remember like five minutes before going on stage, puking out everything I ate oh. half an hour before. Like, I was not prepared for this, right. to be honest. Um, I was, um, yeah, I was still so green in the in the right. whole thing. And uh, yeah. So you were about 20 when you were done with this. Yeah. So what was the next, next step? The next thing was solving fake news. Okay. And, uh, but that company never went live. It mm -hmm. was called Leopia. Mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, it was one of my, um, experiments of creating this true knowledge sharing and, uh, and exploration platform to battle fake news because fake news is not something that Donald Trump invented you know <laughs> it was like uh, since the press actually started yeah. you know the um, that started and um, I remember being amazed that there was this Republican senator that said in the Netherlands like thousands of people are accidentally getting euthanized so we shouldn't do this in the US that was his yeah. reasoning I got shocked I was like what yeah that happens in the Netherlands then I started looking up and apparently it was bullshit <laughs> but then I was thinking but wait a second how many people now yeah in the US, literally think that in the Netherlands, you know, because people are getting the wrong wristband, are getting accidentally euthanized. Must be hundreds of thousands, if not maybe a million or two. Yeah. Um, and then the reasoning was, if you make finding true knowledge so easy, mm -hmm. um, you can have an impact. So with Leopia, we try to do that. Try to create this Q&A, which was reference-based, so if you reference, for example, your own personal blog, you know, people would downvote that answer and it would be uh, gone. So it was a mix between Quora and Wikipedia, but right. then on, on steroids and with like a whole business model behind it where then, for example, if you have a legal question, you could pay a micro fee yeah. and then get a micro, you know, <laughs> Q&A going yeah. on. And then... Uh, but I, I ran into the same problem there, which was like, I really was seeking a, a strong technical co-founder at the yeah. time to help me build this stuff because everything I started, I always, you know, bankrolled myself. Um, and that was very limiting. Yeah. Like, just like with the search engine, like I sold a lot of my domain names back then to fund that business, but also with this one. So it never really went, you know, out of private beta basically. Right. Um, 
So that was also the moment that I thought maybe I should do something in a market that I know. And that's how, you know, my former company got started. Right. So, yeah, let's move on to Dan.com. You know, yeah. I remember you told me that you bought your first domain way back, even before this fake news True. site. Yeah. And yeah. I'm curious how your parents reacted. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so, again, I'm looking online, like... Yeah. How can you make, you know, a buck online? And uh, I end up on this, you know, forum about domain names. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I read about it and then uh, I start looking at, you know, domain names that could be interesting that I can buy, like with, you know, I had a small budget. I think I, I had 150 bucks to spend at the time. Um, so I, I'm looking and I, I find this domain name called instantsoups.com. Yeah. And I'm like, it's 10 bucks. Yeah. Like, come on. Everybody eats noodles, right? <laughs> and uh, I buy this domain name and I remember, you know, I tell my parents, my family, we're at the dinner table. I'm like, uh, I bought a domain today mm -hmm. and I want to sell it. Yeah. And uh, everybody's like, what's the name? And I'm like, instantsoups.com. They <laughs> all start laughing like loud. Like, yeah. Like I think at some point they're laughing, you know, they're, they're rolling on the ground uh, uh, level of laughing. Like they're like, who's going to buy this? What's wrong with you? Do you? you know, that's 10 bucks spent wrong. Yeah. Um, about a week later or two, I sell this domain name to a company called Buy Domains for right. 2,000 bucks. Wow. And then I'm like, that was easy. Yeah. That was really easy. And then... Uh, the fun connection there, though, is like at the time when I sold, you know, my former company, Buy Domains, which kind of kickstarted my whole career in that field, uh, was our biggest seller in terms of inventory. I have mm -hmm. like more than a million domain names. So it started there and <laughs> at some point it ended uh, um, with them as a client. As well. Right. Yeah. So when did you uh, decide that, okay, fine, you've, you sold your first domain and now you're like thinking about, okay, this could be something. Yeah. When did you figure out that, okay, I'm going to make a marketplace for domains? Or how did you get into creating a marketplace? Uh, that was after Leopia. Mm -hmm. And this was the third uh, time I tried to build something. So yeah. we had the search engine. I had this whole um, um, YouTube for documents thing that didn't, you know, catch fire. Right. Uh, or never even launched because uh, I couldn't get it off the ground. And Leopia. So now I was like... Mm, I really need a success. Yeah. I really need to show that, you know, I have what it takes to be an, you know, entrepreneur in the in the online realm. So I thought, you know, I know the I know the dynamics of the domain market. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been a seller on these platforms, I've been buyer on these platforms, and I I knew how, you know, basic these marketplaces were that yeah. that's that I, I started competing with. Um so that's how I got in. And um, we formed a team and we started building, um, you know, uh, a, a modern domain marketplace. Yeah. Um, learned a lot there as well because it did took quite a time before we hit product market fit in that period. And, um, um, but that's, yeah, that's how I got into, uh, yeah. It's all coincidental in yeah. essence. Yeah. So, you know, uh, the question that I wanted to ask you yeah. was, you are not a technical founder, yeah, and true. you've you've seen that not being a technical founder has had some drawbacks, and you've been yeah. dependent on another person's effort yeah. to be yeah. able to build anything. A hundred percent. Do you feel like if you would have been a technical co-founder or a technical founder, yeah. you'd have built way many products and you would have been in much much different place right now? I think I would have built much more products, but I'm not sure if I would have built better products. Right. Because I think. One of the reasons why I'm now so confident in in that's what I do yeah. is um, I can focus on product and strategy, right? And that's and but I understand the whole cycle. I understand, right. you know, how you can get started. How you, for example, build when you're building a double sided marketplace. Yeah, you need to find buyers and sellers and bring them together to transact. If mm -hmm. you only have one side of the table, you still don't have, you know, a machine, an engine running. Um, but because I was able to not focus on, co you know, um, developing and yeah. really building, yeah. I could have developed. 
I've been able to specialize in the other parts, you know, that's right. required to succeed. So I think it's a blessing in the mm -hmm. end because if I was very good at developing, yeah. I'm a hundred percent sure that I've I would have built so many products by now, but none of them would have really gotten to um, I think to that fit. stage. Yeah. Um, yeah. So your process of building, uh, let's say, undeveloped before it was rebranded to yeah. Dan.com, how long did you take to build it and get it to production? Or what were the challenges that you were facing? Well, we started, um, you know, the way you should start. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started with just a static marketplace right? where we got some inventory in from sellers that I knew personally. So yeah. we had some inventory. We had like 50,000 domain names with which we started. 50,000. 50,000. Yeah, but that's not a lot. Like there was <laughs> one seller with 27,000 alone that we onboarded and that's, you know. And, uh, wow. and the thing is, um, um, everything was manual. Yeah. So how Undeveloped started was a buyer would come and show interest in a domain. Mm -hmm. What would happen is I would get an email yeah. in my Gmail and go set up an email to the seller and say, yeah. hey, I got a 200 bucks offer on your domain. What do you want to do? Right. And then the seller would get back to me via email and say, I want 800. And then yeah. I would yeah, fire up Gmail again, contact the buyer and yeah. say, seller wants... <laughs> <laughs> so no one say ten bucks. So I was the marketplace. It was wow. literally I was, it was just the, you. Yeah, just one person company at that time. No, the, no, we were at that time we were with uh, with three. Okay, but in essence, I was the the marketplace yeah. because you were the I was broker. you know exactly. Yeah. And that's how we started, but we gained some momentum and. I think about five months after launching, yeah. we got into the Rockstar Accelerator. Oh. Because uh, we showed some uh, some traction. Which uh, year? This, yeah, I'm really bad at dates. Oh, yeah, Th sorry. There we go again. Like, yeah. you, you keep no, asking no, which no, year. Because no, I was also part of the Rockstar Accelerator. Oh, yeah. And so that's one of why I was very curious. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. And um, and then, you know, at Rockstar, we, we raised our first capital from Exifit Capital. We raised about 350K. Yeah. Um, and then that's the moment we started automating some stuff mm -hmm. so that I didn't <laughs> have to be the marketplace. Yeah. And, and you know, in that period, we went into a lot of directions. Um, um, and um, around 2018... We got a year. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> at some point, we, you know, we found product market fit. Right. Um, but the company was completely different at that time. Yeah. Like... Um, yeah. So after that, uh, also, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but uh, your company was acquired twice. True. Once yeah. by Epic yeah. and next GoDaddy. Can you shine some light on the Epic story? Oh, yeah. That's one that I try to forget. Um, so we weren't in a good place at the time. So, the, you know, we were generating revenue. We were showing growth. But it wasn't good enough yeah. um, for a big Series A. Mm -hmm. So at some point, um, Epic reaches out to us and uh, they're like, we want to do a merger. Yeah. We want to create a super entity. Yeah. So you guys have a secondary market. We have, you know, we're a primary market player. They were a registrar. Combine this and you have this tremendous value proposition, which was true, right. which I truly believed in. Um, but yeah, that that entire deal from the day that we signed the transaction um, showed some red flags. So mm -hmm. three months in, yeah, we we referred to the transaction. We simply said, yeah, this 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 is not going to work. Wow. Um, so you, you could you could just go back and just get out of an acquisition or a merger. I always follow my intuition, and my intuition at the time said, give it at least a year. Right. So we signed a contract where one-sided, we were able to refer the uh, deal, the yeah. transaction, in the first year. Right. And three months into the deal, we already <laughs> referred to the deal because it was it was just not worth it. Oh, wow. And uh, that did introduce, that, that got me into the darkest period of my life. Right. In terms of we had to downscale all of a sudden from 20 people um, to just one. Mm-hmm. And uh, that really hurt it a lot because right. I was again in that whole search engine vibe. 
Right. I was like, okay, this was going well, and mm -hmm. we're back to square again. Yeah. Is this ever gonna change? You know? Yeah. And uh, but that was one of the best things that happened to the company. Right. In essence, in the end, because within I think three months mm -hmm. after that all that happened, we found product market fit. Yeah. And we scaled really fast after yeah. that because if you really look at our KPIs um, from the you know from 2018 and uh, and and later in those two years yeah. we grew a lot and right. uh, and and really got into the uh, the modus and that was also the aha moment for me because <laughs> this was the first time I found real pro you know yeah. uh, product market fit. But product market fit that was sustainable. Right. And the moment you have it, you're like, okay, this is easy. Because scaling from that moment yeah. on, I, I think is one of the easiest things. But True. getting to that product market fit, man, that was hard. Yeah. But once it's there, you're like, okay. Just grow, grow, Let's grow. go. Yeah. You know, and that, you know, it can still go wrong in that period, but then you're making big tactical mistakes. Like right. sometimes I find founders that hit product market fit, think they have a bigger opportunity, pivot, and yeah. then a year or two, they shut down. Yeah. While if they just double down and had the, um, the willingness to wait a little bit longer right. and just be content with, you know, 100% growth year over year doesn't sound a lot, but if you go from 10 million to 20, to 40, to 80, to 160, then That's, it's a game yeah. of just be focused. Don't look at your week. Don't look at your month. Look at your year. If yeah. you're doubling every year, you know, you'll get there. That's remarkable growth. Right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, But it's very doable. Yeah. I mean, it's... Um, so at what point did you decide to rebrand to Dan.com? That was after that failed acquisition mm -hmm. because I, I felt that the whole anyone brand kind of was... Uh, tainted by by this uh, you mean undeveloped undeveloped sorry yeah. <laughs> thank you for correcting me there um, and um, and also undeveloped was a little bit of a clunky brand yep. it did fit what we did because yep. every domain is an un undeveloped piece of land yeah uh, with a lot of opportunity that we wanted to see get developed yeah but yeah the brand was a bit clunky so I just wanted to start fresh, yeah. new brand, new platform, new UI, UX. So we just uh, did the rebranding and that, that's, yeah, I, I think that was right. one of the best things we did because it's really, uh, yeah, caught fire. Yeah, right. Caught on. Yeah. So you told me that, that there was tremendous growth. You, were, you found product market fit, yeah. but why did you end up selling your company? Yeah, good question. Um, because I, I strongly believe that the 100% growth year over year, we could have continued. Yeah. Um, so selling had a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was also, like, if I'm brutally honest, the cap table we had <laughs> at that time. Yeah. Like, it was a very complex capitalization yeah. table. And um, at some point, you got to make a decision of, can I, you know, can I continue growing the company with a cap table like this? Because every, even raising our Series A round yeah. took me a lot of effort to get everyone aligned. Yeah. And, you know, if at that moment that already happens, let alone when the stakes really get high. Yeah. Um, so that was a problem. Um, but also, uh, I was working, you know, on that company for almost seven, eight years. Yeah. And uh, I really wanted to do something new because yeah. the whole uh, strategy uh, for Dan mm -hmm. was already written out literally in the business model and in the business plan yeah. for the next five years. So I noticed I was also engaging on aut autopilot. And as I mentioned, I need challenges. So yeah. um, the whole idea of anyone was also in my mind for already a quite quite long time. So it felt at the right moment, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so when the opportunity came, I just had a you know a shareholders meeting. Um, I proposed, um, you know, or or you know we showed what what deal was on table, 
and unanimously all shareholders said, let's go for the transaction. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't even my decision because so, I just, as the, you know, as the CEO, I had to uh, comply with what the shareholders wanted. And um, yeah, everyone except for one shareholder wanted to do the deal. So yeah. who was the shareholder that didn't want to do it? Uh, he was uh, he was one of the bigger sellers on our platform, yeah. which was afraid that after the transaction, you know, the platform would change. Yeah, and uh, I think in hindsight, he's uh, he's still happy with the transaction, but right. he, he was like, "No, let's not do it." And, uh, <laughs> I'm sure everyone made money in the process, so I think it's a win-win for everyone. Yeah, uh, true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, um, reflecting on your experiences. What are the key lessons you've learned throughout your entrepreneurial journey? Perseverance mm -hmm. is key. Look, we've all read the book, uh, The Lean Startup Machine. Yeah. And um, I even was one of the first that brought The Lean Startup Machine, you know, the whole, um, uh, to, you know, the whole conference and, uh, and, and whatnot and with the workshops and whatnot to Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. But what I saw was that a lot of founders take, you know, what's in there a little bit too literate. Yeah. So like people pivot too fast, but sometimes you need perseverance. You need to keep pushing it to find that product market fit moment. And if you pivot too fast or too often, you, you're just pivoting. Yeah. And um and I think perseverance is 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 in, in the end key because if you strongly believe in that that you're doing and if you can uh, continuously implement improvements, then it feels very incremental what you're right. doing. But if you're week in, week out making incremental, you know, improvements, you will get there. Yeah. But it takes a lot of perseverance because, you know, you need to pay for rent, um, maybe your your family expands, you yeah. get a kid and everything, you know, life is dynamic, things yeah. change. So it's not easy. Um, but in the end, I think one of the reasons why my former company eventually got to an exit was the perseverance of the core group. Yeah, um, We were, w yeah, we just didn't accept failure. Yeah, And we were like, we will keep trying and keep improving. And at some point, you know, the market will respond positively. And right. we had that in 2018. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And speaking of failure, I had this question written down for you. It's <laughs> when life hit you hard so many times, what kept you going? Was failure not an option? For me, it was, it's a personal thing. Like I'm like nothing I do in my life, being in personal relationships or, um, you know, business things or, an, or a, you know, a specific lap time you want to hit in the racing car. I just, I just cannot accept that something is impossible. Mm -hmm. Nothing is impossible. Right. Um, you know, and um, so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a personal thing. I, I just can't give up right. and I won't give up. Right. Um, right. So, you know, yeah. you've had a lot of successes and failures in your life. Yeah. And how has this success and failure affected your current mindset or impacted your current mindset? Tremendously. Like, I'm a completely different person. I mean, like, you know, business-wise, I've had a lot of uh, failures. Yeah. Like, this, from the search engine to Leopia to, to whatever, it felt like I was in this miserable failure streak. I literally have a tattoo on me. By the way, I got that tattoo via a Groupon. This is, I was a student and didn't have money. A Groupon. I swear. And it's a lucky clover. Okay. Why? Because I felt so unlucky. And okay. uh, I thought maybe if I tattoo a lucky clover on me, you know, I start getting luck. And uh, <laughs> Did luck come by after that? A little bit. A little okay. bit. I, I, I got to say it did. But that's also a mindset, mindset thing, right? Thing, yeah. If you think you're unlucky, man, life's going to be harsh mm -hmm. on you. But if you feel like you're lucky, yeah, all of a sudden things go well. So I think for me that my mindset just changed because <laughs> of it, because it did work. But um, so the business failures, yeah. um, they, were, they were learnings because it's just one way for a human to learn. Like I, I, I got a lot of tips and advice from a lot of people, 
but that's not the same as going through something yourself. Yeah. Because I noticed that with myself as well. When I advise people, it's not the same as going through it yourself. So right. those failures literally were my, you know, bachelor's degree, master's degree in how do you build an online product? And I needed it. Yeah. Without that experience, I'm 100% sure that my former company and my next company w wouldn't have succeeded because you right. had to go through that process again. Okay. Personally, same. Like m my relationship, um, when I was 20 until uh, 30, 31, I, I, I had a relationship, you know, with my ex, uh, with which I even got a kid. Um, that relationship eventually, you know, also went bust. Yeah. Um, um, and that changed me a lot because I, I kept looking back at what could have I had done different. Like yeah. some things I did have in, an impact on, some not. For example, you know, bringing home the stress of everything. Like what happened with that first failed acquisition, yeah, that was brutal. Yeah. Like I, I had to let go people that I loved, literally. Yeah. My my colleagues, I, I we, we were a family. Mm -hmm. We built everything together. Letting them go was one of the nastiest, most yeah. horrible things that I had to do. But of course I brought that stress back at yeah. home. And um, you know, so I'm I'm a completely different Right. man at the moment um much more hardened but also yeah yeah much wiser in a yeah. sense um but yeah i think that's a journey everyone has in life like yeah. you have to go through things and uh yeah everyone yeah. has to go through this at some point of the time otherwise if life doesn't hit you hard how else would you learn because life's best lessons 100%. are through experiences I, like you know some people ask for like I wish I had strength. I wish I was stronger in that situation or that. But you have to go through pain. Yeah. Tremendous pain to build that strength. Like exactly. I've never seen someone, you know, you know, no, for example, someone, you know, takes uh, steroids and uh, doesn't work out. Yeah, you might gain a little bit of muscle, but not a lot. You, you have to put in the work. To, Exactly. You need to go through that. You need to, you know, really push it mm -hmm. uh, to gain that strength. So if I look back at the last 10 years, there, there is a lot of sad things that I, yeah. that I can reflect on. But also, like, I, I see, you know, me as a, almost turning from a kid to, to a man yeah. by going through all those yeah. processes. And I'm now in hindsight happy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is a, yeah a sad part about it, but happy that I I went through it because yeah. it, it it will give me a lot of yeah. uh, strength to yeah go to the next things that I want to accomplish in sure. life. Yeah. You, you, you were devastated when you had your first acquisition fail. So how did you actually celebrate when your company was acquired with the big exit? I didn't. I, I strongly remember... The moment the transaction was closed, so all lawyers were in a, in yep. a call, and we, um, yeah, shared the the signatures, which yep. made it then official, and uh, and everybody's like, "Congrats!" and uh, whatnot. I hang up and start crying. <laughs> Literally, Why? I felt I lost everything, mm. and I that year I also lost literally everything. Yeah, I lost my family life. I lost. You know, my relationship with my ex. Yeah. I lost my dog literally that year. Um, I lost my business because it's it wasn't my business anymore. And I, I spent like it 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 was like so I worked like I literally felt so I worked so hard. Yeah. I went through all this for this. <laughs> this yeah. is it. Yeah. And because uh, the way I saw it, I only got some numbers on my bank account and that's it. And that's literally what it is, yeah. by the way, because money doesn't buy happiness or anything. I like some, sometimes I see someone's Instagram and it seems like they're very happy but living a not. very obnoxious, luxurious life. But I know 100% they're not happy. That's, that's, that, that doesn't bring happiness yeah. to you. So for me, it felt very strange, that period. So... I, as of today, still haven't celebrated the exit. It, it yeah. feels to me like, 
maybe even a failure. Like, wow. because I lost something that I spent so much blood, sweat, and tears in yeah. building, and it's now gone. Yeah. Literally. Um, I actually can resonate a lot with that story because yeah. when I sold my company a few months ago, yeah. I didn't celebrate either. Yeah. I didn't know what to do. It was like, yeah. I felt like, oh, this is it. You know, this is what I've been working for years. Yeah. And, and the moment of celebration, I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. That never came by. No. And I think that was the same time I also lost a relationship as well. At the same moment, it was it was like, I didn't celebrate my acquisition. Yeah. And then I had this relationship that ended. Yeah. And it was like a very, very tough time in my yeah. life emotionally. Yeah. And uh, basically I was lost. That's kind of but, what I would say. But my friend, this is exactly what people don't see. Yeah. This is the story behind the successes out there. Yeah. Um, we go through a lot of pain, but mm -hmm. people at some point only see, you know, the success and they're yeah. like, he got lucky or this or that. Yeah. No, like, uh, but that's the... That's the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur. If if you're, in my opinion, if you're a great entrepreneur, you're great at enduring, yeah, and going through pain. But you have tremendous resilience. Yeah, it doesn't break you. Mm -hmm. If if pain and like going through these hardship times doesn't break you, but it it feeds you, mm -hmm. you can accomplish a lot. And right. um, maybe a bad example, because I think Elon Musk is a little bit of a weird one, but he's going through a lot of that as yeah. well. He's, he's one of the most successful, he is the su most successful capitalist in the world. Yeah. But if you see how he operates, mm -hmm. how sensitive he is on, on Twitter, etc., mm -hmm. and and how he responds, with that scuba diver example. So he comes with this ridiculous solution that makes no sense. Yep. And this very experienced scuba diver um, calls him out for that. Mm -hmm. He starts blurting, yeah, this guy is a rapist. What is he doing in Thailand? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, but all these, it feeds him though. Yeah. Like when all, like when he endures something that he doesn't like or whatever, it feeds his ambition level. Right. And, I think that's the reason why he keeps building, you know, buying and building all these um, successful companies because um, it feeds something inside of, uh, you know, right, an entrepreneur. Yeah. Right. So let's actually talk about your existing company, yeah. anyone.com. Yeah. Now, why are you breaking into the very, very competitive housing market? First of all, I... I wanted to have a, a, you know, like anything I touch, it has to above all have an impact. Right. So if we now look at the housing market, I think it's one of the highest uh, impacts you can make in a specific industry yeah. because the future generation is completely left out. Yeah. Um, the current and future generations, like, the, the salary since the 1890s move a little bit uh, with inflation, yeah. inflation, but they're pretty much um, stagnant. House prices are increasing tremendously for obvious reasons like scarcity. It's very expensive uh, due to uh, cost of building to build new inventory mm -hmm. um, uh, and whatnot. And, and so what you now have is a situation that gets worse and worse. And I always make the comparison with Monopoly. Um, Monopoly shows us the end game in the housing market right. in, in just two hours. There's yeah. one you know, entity that will own everything and whoever you know, wants to live in these houses has to pay hefty rent, yeah. rentals. I literally sometimes get a little bit depressed of the idea of us telling the future generation, go work your ass off um, for the system that we have. But it's fine. Rent your bike, rent your car, you know, rent your house. And, you know, when you retire, you'll be fine. I, I'm not sure. Like, that, that's a yeah. very grim outlook we give people. Um, so one of the reasons we got into housing is we see tremendous opportunities there. Mm -hmm. We see tremendous impact there, and yeah. we strongly believe that home ownership 
um, should be a basic human right. Mm -hmm. It it should not be, you know, something that the elite only can have. And that's mm. why, um, you know, we started Anyone and yeah. the company is called Anyone because we strongly believe that anyone should have the security of, a ho you know, a, a house, a home yeah. uh, that you can rely on and a safe place where you can, you know, live um, when you retire. Right. Um, so that's, that's the core reason. Um, plus... In the past 10 years, um, the team that we're working with, we've become masters of, you know, marketplace dynamics. Yeah. And and when I look at the housing market, I see no marketplace dynamics. Yeah. There are There is literally an absence of a true marketplace even. Right. You have listing sites. Exactly. You have... Um, you have places where realtors can list mm -hmm. inventory, mm -hmm. and that's basically it. Yeah. Nobody has built a true marketplace that around the end goal, which is a transaction, moving a house from one owner to another and, and facilitating everything required mm -hmm. uh, in an efficient way. So I almost see it as a virgin market because yeah. I just see that every single thing that I did in the domain market which also didn't have proper marketplace dynamics, mm -hmm. um, is absent in the real estate market. Right. And that's a strange thing because this is the biggest asset class in the world. Yeah. In the US alone, the market is worth 1.7 trillion. So wow. why is this market being mobilized in such an inefficient way? Wow. You know, we have to um, look so into that. You're, you're also saying that sites like Funda or Zillow are yeah. not marketplaces. None of them is a marketplace. On none of these platforms, as a buyer, you can go and sign up and enjoy a, a transaction, find a buyer broker, handle the communication there, yeah. find a mortgage advisor, mm -hmm. get your mortgage done in the same process, find a mortgage provider, get a valuator, and whatnot. As a right. seller, same. You can't go to Funda now and create a, a listing and assign and hire a seller broker to right. to assist you. It's all in. It, it's not even these functions do not even exist. Let wow. alone. Um, so let's yeah, say if someone comes into properly. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, let's say if someone comes into anyone.com uh, in the future and they want to buy a house. Yeah. What do they get out of this? What's the entire process that they yeah. can expect to yeah. experience through anyone? I keep um, making a comparison with Uber. Mm -hmm. I think we actually do almost the same as mm -hmm. what Uber did in yeah. the cab industry before uh, Uber. Yeah. So there was a way mm -hmm. to get a cab. So there is currently an old way of buying a house, but it's just very inefficient. Um but we utilize the best technology and we automate as many as processes mm -hmm. around the transaction um, to just facilitate a tremendously easier and more efficient transaction. Right. And, and along the way, we solve all the core problems that we see. So we started with a liquidity problem mm -hmm. because if the average, like back in the days, the average salary was uh, 30K a year. Yeah. Um, for two times that price, you could buy a house. Wow. Right? Wow. Two times that salary. You can't buy anything for that price today. Good luck. Good luck finding a house for 60K now. You, yeah. you just simply cannot. You can't even So a there is a liquidity problem there. Yeah. So that's, you know, we didn't create the anyone mortgage because we thought, you know, how cool would it be to introduce a new mortgage? We literally looked at the problem. Mm -hmm. And this is this is the exercise we we execute to find product market fit in an extremely short period of time. We right. look at every single stakeholder required for a successful housing transaction, yeah. and we solve every single problem that we that we find mm -hmm. with a very modern solution. So right. mortgages nowadays don't work because mm -hmm. they don't solve the liquidity problem anymore right. in an efficient way. So. The anyone mortgage, you know, was brought to life to solve that specific problem. Wow. Um, and that's the way we think. We're in essence, this is literally what we do on a weekly basis. We look at the prop at what are the most pressing problems, and then we come with solutions mm -hmm. um, that we find effective. Right. Um, yeah. Great. So we're actually coming to the end uh, yeah. of our show. And 
That went fast. <laughs> I'm sure we got a lot more to talk about. <laughs> but based on your journey, yeah. what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs, especially those that are yeah. having setbacks? Um, learn from it. Make a promise to yourself. I'm not going to make a mistake yeah. twice or three times. Mm -hmm. uh, learn learn from every single um, step in your in your way and have grit and perseverance because a hundred percent I guarantee you you will get there if you keep learning yeah if you keep trying you will get there um, if you get in there with the mentality of failure is not an option I don't care if I have to go left right yeah or uh, straight or or maybe sometimes backwards and then two steps forward you'll get there. Um, because I, 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 I've, I've seen it so many times, every successful entrepreneur has gone through that mm -hmm. in, in the same way. Yeah. And don't look at the exceptions mm -hmm. because the Instagrams, etc., and, <laughs> and the WhatsApps, those are the exceptions. Mm -hmm. But a lot of companies are like Adyen, the giant from the Netherlands. Yeah. They didn't, you know, the moment everybody knew them, they were already 15, 18 years old. Yeah. Another example is Katawiki. Yeah. Katawiki, these founders, they just had a hobby. They loved what they were doing. They loved Curiosa and they were operating Katawiki for a very, very long time yeah. before venture money came in and they really, you know, scaled that business. Um, so if you really want to succeed and uh, if you really care about something have that grit have that perseverance keep learning and um, and keep pushing you'll you'll get there right it's it's as simple as that in the end um, wow that's true very remarkable so what was your experience like coming here on the show um yeah like uh, as if we're having a nice chat <laughs> <laughs> i'd say yeah. yeah. So, Reza, yeah. thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah. It was great having you. And I'm sure um, we'll again speak again in the future because I'm sure there's a lot more to talk about, especially with what you're doing at anyone.com and the impact you're going to make in the housing market. I'm very curious about uh, what anyone.com is going to look like maybe in five, 10 years from now. Yeah. Like you said, maybe it will be the brand that no one's heard of, but then everyone's, everyone's using it. Yeah. But I wish you all the best and... Uh, more success with anyone.com. Thank you so much and thanks again for having me. Thank you everyone for tuning in to Unravel. This episode was very, very interesting for me and this whole process of being in a podcast has been very, very rewarding for me. So thank you everyone for tuning in and listening to Unravel. So until the next episode, stay curious and stay healthy.